Welcome back to Rockford Reading Daily. We are continuing to read Hinterland, America's New Landscape of Class and Conflict by Phil A. Neal. We are beginning the second chapter, which is entitled Silver and Ash. We've got about 60 pages into this book. I want to ask people to please share a link to this episode uh, on any social media platform that you may use or frequent or email it to somebody, text message it to somebody, send it in a group chat. We just want to put this episode out to the universe and then let the universe do the rest of uh, getting it out to people or put it out there on the algorithm. Let the algorithm do the rest of the work of getting it out to people. Remember, we put these episodes out on SoundCloud, Spotify, Pocket Cast, Anchor, YouTube, Facebook. Anywhere audio is available, we have this podcast series available. And chapter one was entitled Oaths of Blood. We learned some of, some about the alt-right groups and uh, right-wing groups that are organizing in rural West, West Coast states and West Coast cities. We learned about some of the commonalities between urban and rural political struggles. We learned about some of the uh, ideologies of some of these groups. We learned about how the government functions in some of these areas. And for me, specifically, this was, uh, it was some new terminology that I was introduced to, some new government organizations that I was introduced to. Uh, we, and also a, a new, a new base of people, uh, or a new set of issues, I should say, that people are struggling against that I learned about as well. Most of the things that we have read about up to this point have been very specifically urban issues. And this book is sort of uh, putting us into more rural issues. Also, a lot of the things that we've read about before when it's been organizing has been about uh, organizing with people who are more centered towards the same ideologies that we have in in the previous chapter we learned about people who would be less aligned with us and some of their organi organizing tactics. Uh, and so those are some of my previously ons to start this episode out, but to get a more in-depth understanding of the things that we read about, uh, please go listen to episodes, the episodes where we read through chapter one. So let's begin chapter two, which is entitled silver and ash. The soil was blood red heavy with iron and other ancient metals, gestated by the slow knotting and fissuring of tectonic eons, now uplifted and ground apart by air, water, and an invisible chaos of microscopic life. It's often hard to connect the solidity, 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 solidity. It's often hard to connect the solidity of earth and stone to their explosive origins as pressure flays subducted rocks down to their constituent chemicals and builds them back stronger, all driven by that deep, distant rumbling of the at atmosphere atmosphere where solid stone flows like slow blood this and everything below just ripples in that constant low level explosion atop which continents and ocean floor float like a fragile halo when the bomb went off i don't remember seeing the combustion just the soil turned to red dust small stones raining down into my hair Maybe the babysitter, in a fleeting moment of responsibility wedged between making the bomb out of gunpowder in a plastic Coke bottle in the garage and lazily hurling it underhand into the ridge like a softball, had covered our eyes, concerned about the splinters of granite that might soon be bulleting towards us. Or maybe explosions are sometimes just things you can't really see entirely because they happen at a different scale than that to which we're attuned. Just as the tectonic crushing and flaying of minerals to make this incardine earth is itself an explosion too slow to see. It was sometime in the early mid to it was sometime in the early to mid 1990s when everything had already begun to shake apart even as we were told that the war for the world had finally been won. I always have trouble remembering my age and that interval between the end of the Cold War when my first muddiest memories were gathering and the fall of the twin towers when I was just beginning to hit puberty. Maybe it's just too hard to think back to the end of history, a temporal glitch that was soon overcome as the wars and riots flooded in again. But maybe it's more than in the countryside, but maybe it's more that in the countryside there just wasn't much left to remember. Mining had collapsed long ago. Timber fell in pieces, starting with the plummet in the late 1970s, 
recovering to a lower plateau in the 80s and then declining ever since. Farming experienced the height of its crisis in the 80s, but in reality, this was simply one period in a long decline in employment driven by mechanization. Unemployment wasn't the only thing left when the industries went. Loggers and miners had long used stimulants to stay awake for 12-hour shifts of hard labor. When the mills and mines left, the meth didn't, and thus the crisis birthed the tweaker. I would only realize that this term is not ubiquitous much later when a friend who had lived most of her life in the cities came to Oregon to work on a fire crew. We're keeping itinerant and itinerant, excuse me. We're keeping itinerant tweakers out of makeshift camps was a regular task near any inhabited area. There is an entire art to it, really. The goal being not to get bitten, scratched, or come into contact with tweaker blood, all while also not getting robbed. In recent years, the term has generalized with the drugs and fashion. Shows like Breaking Bad bringing meth into prime time just as opiates were becoming the cutting-edge narcotic of choice in the countryside. Before ketamine was a party drug, it was a common anesthetic for livestock, pets, and wildlife, after all. Tweaker demographics have changed somewhat over the years, but at the time, the term still referred specifically to white meth addicts. The babysitter had what I would later come to recognize as tweaker eyes, bespeaking other explosions happening at other scales. The euphoric chemical explosion of dopamine and nor nori nor nor pinefreen, nor pinefreen in the brain. The periodic explosion of meth labs in the forest, like the sound of ancient trees finally being felled. The slow explosion of a rural way of life out into a groundless scattering of scams and desperate private miseries. After a life mostly lived in the country, I am convinced that the eyes of tweakers see something that other eyes do not. Those orbs gouge deep down into their sockets like ant ant lions awaiting ant ant lions like ant lions awaiting prey. Their presence only hinted at by that brief glint of quivering motion beneath the surface, as if the eyes are sunk straight back into the brain and thereby open to some sort of neutral augury. The iris black like a single, dilated pupil, open to the world's many wounds, and thus capable of seeing that world as it is. A congress of explosions tearing bodies apart, all at different speeds and in different directions. This reality is a horror native to country people, accounting for our fascination with meth first and opiate second. One gives sight that reaches too far, illuminating monstrosities at the depth of a shattered world and the other offers at last the consolation of a slow and quiet blinding. Can I throw it next time? The son asked, and the father shook his head. You're still too young. The son, Bear, was my age, whatever that was, his nickname taken from his habit in winters of running outside and rolling around in the snow, quote, bare ass naked, end quote as if he were trying to put out some sort of fire that has spread across the entirety of his body. When he played with toys, he would simply take one in each hand and smash them together as hard as he could until bits were flung off in every direction. I don't know what became of him after his parents went to jail. Before the dust had even settled, he was running into the small crater made by the explosion, as if magnetized to it. He returned from the dust cloud holding a small shard of the plastic bottle aloft, his face caked with ruddy soil fissured by streaks of sweat. Tweakers have become objects of revulsion within rural America, not due to their many moral failures or seemingly plague-ridden bodies, but because of their matter-of-fact recognition that those of us from the country are all already dead. The way of life has been destroyed in a devastating, irrevo irrevocable fashion, essential industries torn out from under us, ecosystems raised, and everyone left suffering not just material deprivation, but an expansive social and cultural collapse that can only be characterized as apocalyptic. The many new non-denominational Christian sects that sprang up in the early stages of this collapse offered a simple solution for the dead, to become born again. But now even these sects are shrinking as people see what the tweakers' as heresy have perceived all along. The born again are born dead, or die soon after through the thousand sacrificial cuts of daily drudgery. The rapture of apocalypse is therefore not on its way, but instead long past, were adrift in its wake. As even the new Christian sects collapse, 
A vacuum is left at the social core of the small towns and expansive counties that compose rural America. This vacuum has not yet been filled, but the tweaker is in a way a vanguard of whatever's coming. And this vanguard is neither inherently right-wing nor left-wing, despite the long-standing affinity between Nazis and amphetamines. The tweaker instead represents the most basic recognition of the ways in which the far hinterland has been made futureless, an organic nihilism emerging from the American countryside, unprecedented and unpredictable. I turn my head from the, cra- from the crater and the soil street child to gaze out beyond the old timber road cut into the red dirt of the ridgeline, across second and third generation forests barely re- recovered from a century of constant denudation. In the distance, you can see a spattering of small clearings where people gardened or grew weed, their small figures just barely visible, shuffling between ant-like herds of livestock and labyrinths of gutted trucks and tractors. Explosions from a sort of foundational ritual here because they match the tweaker's vague recognition with an equally vague hope. The sense that cataclysm is a thing that can be built and not just suffered under, that it might be possible for people living in the wake of a world-breaking apocalypse to build their own form of spectacular violence, not striving to become born again or build another, better world, but just to force the end of this one to go all the way up. And that brings us to a changing of the theme within this chapter, so let's have a reflection. So, as Phil A. Neal was talking to us about tweakers, what stood out to me is the... Even though it's a different drug being used, you know, methamphetamines and, and opiates uh, being the main drug of choice that we're speaking about right now in Hinterland, there is a correlation between the books that we've read, uh, whether it be High Risers or a book we just finished reading, Evicted, where people were also struggling with addiction issues in urban areas of the country, as opposed to the what we're reading right now about people struggling with addiction in rural areas. And we see the disdain is the same in rural and urban areas to people who have succumbed to these uh, issues of addiction. And uh, again, the, the sense of desperation and the sense of hopelessness, he used the word nihilism is something that is another connection or correlation between the the existence in rural America and existence in urban America. In the book that we read by Cornell West entitled Race Matters, one of the first chapters was talked about blackalism, nihilism, excuse me, in black America. And it was one of the first times I had heard that term being used uh, for black America. And it was something that very, that very much opened my eyes or was a, a an awakening experience for me reading that because I began to be able to identify and understand not under identify nihilism uh, as it was taking place in certain areas of uh, black life. But also I began to be able to uh, have a better understanding of the word as well. And so to, to be reading about, rural America and reading about predominantly areas that are predominantly uh, white and to be hearing that same word be used again, it reminds us that there are so many commonalities that exist beyond the race line. Uh, But until we can acknowledge and uh, break that social construct, it'll always, that'll always be a hindrance to getting people to understand these commonalities. And so I think that, uh, one of the things that reading books like Hinterland does is it pushes your vantage point further out, your perspective further out. And as you do that, you begin to see we have more in common than we have uh, different. Armies of mud and flame. I was raised in the mountains overlooking a small river valley in a mildly secessionist border territory stretched between Oregon and California. Distant from the administrative centers of either state, the area seems to be governed more by a congress of floods, fires, and other forces of nature. In the depths of the Klamath Mountains, alpine snow melt winds down narrow cuts of granite into storm-fattened rivers that ride through the valley bottoms like blue-green eels. Blue 
Black bears hibernate in hidden, snow-sealed grottos. Elk brush their broad antlers through the soft needle bowery of fir and pine. In spring, rainstorms and thawing frosts dislodge entire ridge lines from the mountains, periodically feeding roads, houses, and rich-smelling groves of evergreen into the endless maw of churning water. Everyone seems to know someone who was sacrificed to those grand, deadly rivers, the claimant, the rogue, the trinity. The region's mountain geography has its social counterpart. Upriver means mostly white valley towns encircled by alfalfa with farms and ranches stretched up into the foothills. It means church, school, post office, the places where power seems to touch down from afar, if only gently. Downriver, on the other hand, is a violent land speckled with mud, is a violent land speckled with mud sunken trailers, overgrown trailheads, secretive mansions built by weed barons, and ramshackle hamlets beyond the reach of any highway. Farms give way to forest service substa substations and, farther still, the tribal lands and reservations along the rivers' lower reaches. Downriver is where the waters converge. Any corpse dumped upstream will finally surface there, bobbing and circling in eddies where the rivers mix. It's a land that's hardly land, more a swirl of water and roots hailed by storms, a place where dark stories grow into ponderous myths overlooking the timbered ruin. It has the uncanny feel of an almost foreign country. The downriver towns are painted with tribal symbols or fly the libertarian flag of the state of Jefferson, emblazoned with a gold pan and two X's, signifying that we've been, quote, double-crossed, end quote, by the government. In the 1970s and 80s, a series of communes were set up along the Salmon and Klamath by back-to-the-land hippies convinced that America was a soulless empire on the verge of collapse. The deep folds of oak and evergreen were to be a site of spiritual rebirth, a catchment for refugees from a dying nation. But over the space of a decade, the empire refused to die, and each of the communes fell instead, evacuated of everything but their guns and drugs. Now those who are left simply cursed the state for wanting to flood the valleys to, sip, to siphon more waters to the cities in the south. Along the river roads, Meth-stricken Sawyer set up small stands selling burl statues of bears and hunched, grim-looking Sasquatch. In summer, wildfires sparked in the unpopulated interior burst forward like an invading army. Clear-cutting had led to mass replanting of trees, and property protection had encouraged widespread fire prevention, all ensuring that the regrown forest would be neither staggered in its growth nor properly thinned. Meanwhile, deadfall would accumulate unhindered. New seeding of fire symbiote evergreens would be slowed, and the natural fire break offered by oak savanna gradually closed. The feedback is essentially the same as that between bubble, crisis, and stimulus in today's economy. All of this leads to larger, less containable wildfires, which of course increase the demand for fire prevention and thereby increase the risk and severity of future wildfires. As the bubble gets bigger, so does the coming crisis, an even bigger debt finance stimulus is required to combat it when it hits, laying the ground for the next crisis, ever larger than the first. There is no final crisis, just the continual management of widening collapse. Individual disaster industries tend to rapidly become self-sufficient, predicated on an underlying, secular increase in the scope and scale of their devastation. But the greater the devastation, the greater the resources required for its management. In late summer, yellow clad wildland, fi wildland firefighters flood into the many hidden valleys of the Trinity Alps, the Marble Mountains, and the Calmopesis Wilderness, where they fight the invading flames in a series of defensive battles that invariably end in defeat. Afterwards, everything is laid to waste, the earth char black, yellow shirts and green pants dimmed under a gray silk of ash. Nonetheless, it's one of the few decent paying jobs that can be found in the area, no small matter in places like Trinity County, California, which reached almost 20% unemployment at the height of the last crisis. The firefighters therefore tend to be ruralities drawn from different parts of the greater region, sometimes deployed a county over and at other times called to quail far off infernos rolling through the North Cascades or Cor, Cor de, de Alines or Cor de Alines. French, I'm thinking that's French. 
<clears throat> all ultimately paid for by federal money, the industry is cut into an ornate hierarchy defined by proximity to the source of funding, which translate into intricate divisions of labor and status on the ground. The most privileged strata of workers are those employed directly by the Forest Service or the Bureau of Land Management in states like Nevada. They are generally the best paid and best equipped crews, and their status is marked both by their vehicle vehicles' insignia and by more minor social signals, such as the way that their gloves are affixed to their uniform. The contract crews, on the other hand, are a far more flexible labor force employed by private companies that compete to win federal contracts. Since these crews are only deployed when there's a fire, the Forest Service doesn't have to incur the cost of maintaining them across the entire season. If timber and ore were the gods of the Old West, fire and flood are the gods of the new one. With little to replace collapsed productive industries, the last few decades have seen the region become more and more dependent upon government funding, all the surrounding counties essentially mirroring the predicament of Josephine County described in the previous chapter. Much of this funding is poured into agencies such as respective state departments of transportation, which help to repair the massive stretches of roads that are destroyed by landslides every season, again, often through baroque systems of subcontracting. Natural disaster, rarely, quote, natural, end quote, in any real sense, is one of the only industries left, and rural areas have adapted to exploit this last, desperate economic opportunity. Nowhere is this clearer than in wildland firefighting and the transformation of the Forest Service. In 1991, Fire suppression accounted for about 13% of the agency's budget, but by 2012, it made up more than 40%. Frequently, this hasn't been enough to cover fire suppression, and in recent years, the agency has regularly overspent. After burning through its fire suppression budget in 2013, the agency announced in August that it was cutting $600 million in other areas of its work to fund firefighting, leading some to disparag disparagingly refer to it as the fire service. This trend only intensified in subsequent years. By 2015, fire suppression consumed 52% of the budget, and the Forest Service itself projects that by 2025, that number will rise to a staggering 67%, essentially completing the wholesale transformation of the agency. This has already been accompanied by a complete inversion in agency employment with fire staffing more than doubling in size to compose the majority of Forest Service jobs, while the number of non-fire staff has been halved. Moreover, this number doesn't count the numerous outside contractors employed during fire season. The coincidence of mass drought, poor management, and a desperate need for jobs have all combined to more or less guarantee the replacement of an old land management agency by a quasi-military fire service capable of offering at least a minimal level of employment amid economic devastation. When fires do break out, much of the immediate area takes on the character of a war zone. Mass evacuations are accompanied by the establishment of incident command centers surrounded by a constellation of forward operating bases from which teams of firefighters can be deployed to defend key assets and establish a coherent front against the oncoming blaze. Kevlar-clad sawyers tear into the forest like a barbarian horde hacking its way through some monstrous enemy. Swampers scurry back and forth, clearing the sawyers' trail of devastation, all in orchestrated chaos designed to cut a line capable of starving the fire of its fuel. The logic and the methods are essentially military and draw heavily from both the logistics and theory of contemporary counterinsurgency operations. Fire crews are relatively dissected disaggregated, small teams of specialists deployed to combat not only a concrete enemy, but the very environment from which it draws its power. The goal is not really victory, but containment, attrition, and the continual management of a war that never ends. Many contract crews are run by veterans, and the Forest Service itself often partners with the military, even using Air Force equipment in deploying active Army and Marine units to fight on the fire lines. While funding is funneled through the federal agencies such as the Forest Service or Bureau of Land Management, most wildland firefighters are on contract crews in which they tend to make less than $1,000 a week for continuous stretches of seven-day weeks. Technically, 14 days is the maximum before at least two days off are required, but this is often extended. 
and even then, they are likely only working for a few months out of the year, if that. The work, of course, is immensely dangerous. In 2013, a rapidly moving wildfire near Yarno, Arizona, overcame a team of firefighters on a local crew, killing 19. This crew was an all-elite, quote, hot shots, end quote, team funded by local and state government, all of its members experienced and well-equipped. Contract crews, on the other hand, are often undersupplied and usually operated as a minor warlord fiefdom might be, one's fate determined by the whim of crew commanders and the bosses above. But in these places, any pay is good pay. According to the USDA's Economic Research Service, Almost all the counties that compose the California-Oregon border region are either, quote, federal state government dependent, end quote, or, quote, non-specialized, end quote. Across the entire nation, counties in these categories already had the lowest median incomes and the highest poverty rates on average out of all rural counties prior to 2008. They saw an even further drop in incomes and an increase in poverty during the height of the crisis. But more importantly, they also never experienced a substantial bounce back during the, quote, recovery, end quote. Instead, income simply kept dropping for four years, finally flatlining and then inching up ever so slightly after 2013-2014, but never regaining their previous, already extremely low, levels. Similarly, poverty rates still sit some two to three percentage points higher than their already high pre-recession levels. Those working the line know there are very few other options. Most are not local to the area, but the vast majority tends to come from the same global hinterland. After working a season on a crew in Idaho, Lennon Berglund, a journalist writing for Vice, confirms this, explaining that his co-workers, quote, come from a range of places and backgrounds, but most have spent at least part of their lives at the edge of society, in broken homes plagued with abusive families and drugs, end quote. Though many more are drawn from the bottom rungs of the white population, the fire crew, like most workplaces in the hinterland, tends to be far more diverse than one might presume. Berglin describes one crew member born in Medellin, Colombia, but raised by Mormons in Idaho, hoping to earn enough money from the season to travel to Colombia and find his family. A growing number are also inmates, especially in California, where some 30 to 40 percent of all wildland fighters are prisoners mostly low-level felons who have volunteered to join a, quote, conservation camp, end quote, in which they are paid $2 a day while in the program and $2 an hour when on the line. But Berglund also captures the image of a typical non-inmate firefighter and his crew in western Idaho. Quote, Hans is one of the few men with the family. He grew up in the white supremacist-dominated section of northern Idaho, poor, with an asshole stepfather who later killed himself with a shotgun. Hans used to go to the woods every fall with a buddy, a case of beer, and a chainsaw to harvest large pole to harvest large pole pines to sell for firewood. He is by far the hardest worker on the crew, smiling constantly and telling stories about hunting, fighting, and getting in trouble with the Idaho police. He is working to pay for chemotherapy for his six year old daughter with leukemia. End quote. This is but one of many similar stories that populate the war zone workplaces of the far hinterland where productive industries have largely been replaced by an ever-losing battle against our epoch's colliding catastrophes. Okay, so we're going to end this episode here, have a reflection, and then wrap it up, and then we will be back tomorrow to continue reading Hinterland and pick up on the next section, which is entitled Hidden Temples. And I think it'll probably be about two to three more episodes before we get done with this chapter. Uh, what stands out to me is... The the fires, this industry of 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 combating these these wildlife fires, the amount of resources that go, are going into creating to to fighting these fires, also the things that led to these fires being this combustible, this sort of never ending cycle of of capitalism that has sort of ballooned and uh, is. And has deprived so many resources from these areas. I think that's one of the other things that stands out to me as well as we continue reading is just seeing how detrimental these, uh, how detrimental some of these, uh, 
institutions, institutions, not the word I'm looking for, uh, companies, how detrimental some of these companies and, uh, ah, that's a word I'm looking for. Hold on. Companies works. How detrimental these companies have been to this hinterland area. Uh, they talked about the, the mining. They talked about the cutting down of timber for trees. They're talking about these fires. And so the same way that you can, we've been able to point out how in urban areas, capitalism has been detrimental to the, the type of uh, living conditions that people are in. We can also see here in rural areas how that's the case as well. Also, one of the things we commonly talk about or and that I regularly talk about in the things that we've read is how deindustrialization affected these inner city areas. And we see here how the these industries being removed or not being as lucrative anymore in these rural areas have had the same effect. You know, mining not being as lucrative anymore. They pointed out the the timber not being as lucrative anymore and all the effects that that had and the amount how the how it was not as economically advantageous anymore or financially advantageous anymore and i think all of those things again they just go to fill out this this picture of of the the country that we live in i think that one of the things we can't do is get too isolated in our perspective and uh, this book has made me widen that vantage point again. And I think at first when you begin to do it, it begins, you know, it is sort of uh, uncomfortable. You're reading something, the words, terminology is a little different. They're using words that uh, aren't, that haven't been used as some of the other things that have an ideology and beliefs that we haven't sort of touched on and, and other pieces of literature that we've read. But as we have, as we get deeper and deeper into this book, I understand more and more the the crisis that this that these rural areas are facing, and I also see the connections to the urban crisis more and more as well. And and then one of the other things that stood out to me is when we were reading Evicted. I think that's the first time we read something that was touching about people's experiences and lives in trailer parks. And again, in Hinterland, we're also reading about, you know, people in trailer parks uh, or oh, it's people in trailer. Park. We're reading about somebody who was also living in a trailer park. And we, we, they read, we read about here how people living in the trailer parks live downstream more. And I just think that that's, again, an important connection to be able to draw and to be able to make uh, when we're talking about commonalities between uh, different experiences. So share this episode, please. Remember, we put these episodes out on a daily basis to provide people the opportunity to begin or further their journey in the struggle against police terrorism, mass incarceration, and racial injustice. And I will holler at you tomorrow as we continue reading Hinterland, America's New Landscape of Class and Conflict by Phil A. Neal.